Welcome back. Back with another banger. It's the React Fox, where we react to the creepiest, craziest, scariest TikToks. You should watch them. Hope you're having a good night. If you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like, subscribe, ring that notification bell, just to make sure the algorithm knows what's up. So let's get straight to it. You're stuck within the cage, the rib cage. You're in a prison cell because you're made out of cells. You are hexed in physical matter. This is the X, the hex. The hexagram's a cube. A cube unfolded is the cross. You need to X escape the physical world, the three dimensional matrix, which is the world of Saturn, Satan. Because Satan gives you the mark of the beast, the physical body, the 666 carbon suit, and then blinds your mind. Your mind is completely separate from the physical world. Through physical pleasures and lack of understanding of yourself, you think your mind is part of your physical body. When in reality they are two separate things, your mind is completely separate from your physical body. The physical world is a dimension within your mind. Men means mind, mental. Mind in Latin means mens. In order to escape the three-dimensional physical world, you have to fully detach your mind from your body. Meditation is key in transcending the 3D world and traveling the depths of your mind. Mind and matter is one. They are different dimensions within your mind. When you dream, your mind creates matter. This is why mind and matter are one. The cube is the shape that gives rise to physical matter. The link is in my bio for the Book of Wisdom, paperback and PDF. It's crazy, that rib cage in the cage to the cell with the blood cells so much wordplay shout out to revival of wisdom i have been working on a thing and it is not finished yet but this thing is like very important to the meaning of life um and therefore the meaning of love so what the frick does this have to do with love well nikola tesla 369 baby now i know you've heard about that and i think you'd want to hear about ideas. Let's break this down circle square by circle square. You can already notice the similarities between that graph and these proportions. These are the golden ratio proportions. And this sequence of squares can start pretty much anywhere. You just have a basic unit of measurement to kind of keep track of it all. So we started at a random point here and we decided to take this polar. Now you may or may not be asking, Carly, wait, this polar? What do you mean, this polar? Ah oh, yes, friends. To this life, there is a coin, and the coin has two sides, and it has to have two sides in the conceptual nature of things, not the tangible, but the conceptual, and therefore tangible, in order to balance out, in order to stabilize in one singularity type of place place i'll say in quotations so your experience as a human being here on earth is moving this way but what if i told you that in some sort of parallel reality literally there's a whole other type of being or consciousness or life form of some kind that is moving this way to counteract your experience of time going this way crazy little concept but an example of that could hypothetically be water wind and light and these are all waves so why why is 369 so important with this? Well, because 369 is symbolic of waves and replication. Replication kind of like genetic replication or in relation to genetic replication, like cloning, like the thing that many dictatorships and scientific organizations throughout human history have been obsessed with because it's extremely linked to basically becoming God on this earth. <laughs> yup. Shout outs to subliminalized youth. AKA Carly. Yo, she be breaking it down. She mad young. But she's already doing the golden ratios and yo, at her age, no way was I drawing any of that stuff or making any comparisons. I had a friend who did. Shout out to Jamel, wherever you have, you see this, what it do. But yeah, all of that. I'm talking sixth grade. He already knew what was up. In genetics, I started digging into this. I said, why is this color difference? I shouldn't be this skin tone because my ancestors were working in the fields of Africa, walking in the sands of the desert. It's ridiculous. That's the theory, right? It's That's the theory. It's because being out in the sun all day yeah. produces more melanin to yeah. protect you from... Foolishness. Right. 
what I discovered real science in real books in colleges. It says that there's a 2% variance in genes between races of people. Now that 2% difference is so big on the genetic scale that it would take multi millions of years to happen naturally through natural evolution, but it happened in 200,000 years. So what the scientists are saying is it happened artificially. They say they don't know how it happened artificially, but when you look at the Sumerian tablets, you discover the Tower of Babel incident, it really explains what happened. Billy Carson always be dropping gems. Like he said, this may have started at that Tower of Babel incident, right? You know about that, you know about it. Greetings, we are the Arcturian Council. We are pleased to connect with all of you. We are as happy as many of you are about the disclosure that is taking place at this time on the topic of UFOs. This disclosure has been happening for quite some time, as many of you know, and every time that something else is disclosed, you get a bit more confirmation of what you already knew to be true. So what does this then signify for humanity? What does it mean when a country's military announces publicly that they have seen objects in the sky that they could not account for? We want to stop those of you who are going to see this as an intentional distraction from going there, and instead, we want you to open up yourselves to the possibility that this means more humans are ready to understand that you are not alone in the universe at this time. From where we are sitting, that is the takeaway. Now, many of you will get very excited about sharing this with members of your family and friends who have thought your beliefs quite bizarre for quite a while now, and certainly you can take some satisfaction in knowing that you are validated. But the much bigger picture here is how these disclosure events keep getting bigger and bigger because that indicates that something big is going to happen there on Earth. What will happen will be much bigger than people feeling validated about their beliefs. Many people have wondered when contact with ETs would be openly discussed by high-ranking government officials from powerful countries. You are indeed coming into that time now, and you can rest assured that this all means that more is coming, and more and more. And someday you will have ETs walking amongst you openly, as crazy as this may be to believe for some, this will be the reality. You will be able to ride on their ships and go to faraway places, and they will share their technology with everyone. This is happening, and it's part of the shift in consciousness. Now, you might wonder what the relationship is between UFOs, ETs, and your ascension. It is quite simple, really. You need to know that you are much more than just physical bodies with brains who are living out a lifespan in a single lifetime on a single planet. You need to know that there is a bigger story to who you are where you came from, and even how you were created to be how you are now as the human race. The answers to those questions will expand consciousness there on your world. People will start to think differently, and it is okay to have something happen then that causes people to think differently. It is perfectly fine that it's not just coming because a person meditated for 12 hours a day for 12 days straight. It is reasonable that it is happening through ET contact rather than through some other spiritual place that led to someone's enlightenment. This opens up the channel for mass contact. That is one way. That is one experience. But you don't have to earn the expansion of your consciousness. It's very natural for it to occur, and it is occurring, and this is a reflection to you of that. And you can all breathe a sigh of relief because this is hard evidence that more is coming, and that the more that is coming is what you have wanted for a very long time. Relax, smile, and take a deep breath, because you have made a tremendous stride forward yet again there on planet Earth. We are the Arcturian Council, and we have enjoyed connecting with all of you. Shout out to the Arcturian Council. Shout out to Interdimensional Being for posting this. Shout out to Daniel for making the video. I mean, listen, you know, I don't even know if the Arcturian Council is real, right? One thing they did say that I agree with is that, you know, it's going to be normal one day to walk around with ETs and stuff like that, I feel, for entertainment purposes only, you know, you never know, man. So, this TikToker could be way ahead of his time. Imagine if that time came and they had to go back to the TikTok for the archives and there was an Arcturian Council, right? Y'all would have to come back here to the React files. It was like, yeah, we saw it here first. It was true. 
Let me know in the comments down below what y'all think of this. Jesus knew this knowledge, the knowledge of your electromagnetic field. Without it, you are lost. Your internal, mental, and emotional states manifest your external physical world. Your heart produces this field, and you feel your emotions in the heart. Your thoughts create your emotions. Your emotions create the electromagnetic field from the heart, the energy in motion. And your electromagnetic field creates your physical reality. This means your external world is a reflection and a physical manifestation of your internal, mental, and emotional state. This is why your life is hell. Because you had been taught that your emotions are something that should be reactive. When in fact you should be choosing the emotions you feel so that you manifest the emotion that you feel in your external world. Because by feeling that emotion, you become that vibration. Your vibe attracts your tribe. You attract whatever vibration that you are. By combining your electric thoughts and magnetic emotions to feel something before you have it, this is how you become that vibration. You create your own reality. The universe is mental. Everything exists within your mind. Stop worshipping Jesus and all of these religions and external gods because they do not exist. Everything exists within you. You are the universe. Literally playing a game. You can manifest anything you want in this world. You need this to learn how to manifest properly. One thing I could definitely pull from that is that your vibe attracts your tribe. Shout outs to all of y'all watching right now. I appreciate y'all. Let's keep going. During the blood moon sign of Jesus in the tomb, while Venus the bride is hanging on the cross in the judgment scales. I remember what an ominous feeling I had about it all as this day was approaching. And I sort of thought we could have been raptured about two weeks before this event. And I was saying that it was not a good sign for Israel for the bride to be hanging on the cross like that during that particular blood moon with the two witnesses right there with her. And perhaps I was right exactly 333 days later to the hour Israel was attacked and it was all out war. In some spooky way it reminds me of what Jesus had to say to John as he hung on that cross. Behold thy mother. Those statements that Jesus made to both of them always haunt me because I feel in some way he was saying it to all of Israel. Whatever your beliefs, what I want to show you are the facts that Stellarium is showing. This was, I believe, Resurrection Day of 30 AD, and this was the Blood Moon Lunar Eclipse on November 8th of 2022. Exactly 42 months to the day of when Israel celebrated their 71st birthday, and then exactly 333 days after this blood moon, Israel was attacked. This slide is from my previous videos. The top half is something I posted back in 2022 when I was talking about where the blood moon would be happening on November 8th. As you can see, on the day that Israel celebrated turning 71, the sun was again in this position at the hind foot of Aries. The same as on the day Jesus Christ had risen and returned to his apostles. Exactly 42 months to the day after their birthday celebration was the longest blood moon in 33 years that happened in that same spot that the sun traversed during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. Then, exactly 333 days later, Israel was attacked and the battles began. And if you saw my last few videos, when I was talking about the need to spend 40 days with Jesus in the upper room, or your quiet space, beginning at the sign of Jonah, 
that I was also seeing in the wee hours of January 19th. It all just makes perfect sense to me. January 19th was the same sign in the heavens on the very night that Jesus returned from the grave and met with his apostles in the upper room. That just totally blows my mind. January 19th and the same sign in the heavens that marked the very start of the 40 days that Jesus spent with his apostles. And what I've been calling the sign of Jonah's 40 day warning cry. Those 40 days gets us to leap day when the moon exactly rises once again at the foot of Virgo. You just can't make this stuff up. Look at exactly moonrise over Jerusalem on Passover 30 AD and leap day of 2024. Exactly 40 days after I see the warning signal of Jonah and then 40 days after leap day is the great American eclipse. And those days leading up to the eclipse from leap day on my timeline are the days of Noah, which I'm afraid could be big trouble. And I'm just getting started with all this. If your mind isn't already feeling twirly, then just wait. And if you haven't seen the last four videos on my channel, you might want to watch them. So. I think my January 19th date is a match for the sign in the heavens for the very night that Jesus first met the apostles in the upper room. Not a match as in dates, but a match as in signs on God's clock. And it just totally blows me away that I was warning everyone to get into their upper rooms and spend some time with Jesus starting at sundown on January 18th. And I hadn't even realized all this stuff yet. I told about this before when it first happened, but I woke up from a crazy dream on October 7th, dreaming about the number 7,000, having no idea what it all meant. It made no sense in my dream, but it felt like the finger of God had touched my mind, which woke me up. I immediately got on the internet and started seeing the news reports that weren't even an hour old, saying that Israel had been attacked. So I searched it all out in the Bible, and it was about Revelation chapter 11 and the 7,000. What John is referencing in Revelation chapter 11 verse 13 are the remnant of the 7,000 that God had saved in Israel while Elijah spent his 40 days on the mountain with God. The tenth of the city that John says will fall is the remnant that God saved in Jerusalem from Isaiah chapter 6. But that whole biblical study is perhaps for another time. Pause it and take notes if you need to and read about it. Read Isaiah chapter 5 too. It goes right along with Revelation and the harvest. If you ask me, the second woe is nearly past and the third woe comes quickly. And that's when the seventh trumpet sounds and it's Judgment Day and Wrath. I hope everyone is prepared and spending as much time as they can in the Word and doing studies and just hanging out with God every moment. So let's get through this. Hopefully this is the easy stuff. I guess the next thing I noticed was that on Passover of 30 AD our king planet Jupiter is sitting right on the cord of Pisces. And that's right where this upcoming eclipse is going to happen. 
Here's the side-by-side -side shots of the two events, 2,000 years apart. And on the day that I think Jesus was crucified, is this our signal of the start and then the end of the church age? What are the odds of this happening? Especially after what I've been showing you, the king planet on that cord to start the church age, and the sun and the moon together on that cord to bring an end to the church age. These are the two great American eclipses. The one from 2017 occurred right next to Regulus, the king star in the heart of Leo. So I looked again at Passover of 30 AD, and there it is, Uranus, sitting right at the king star of Regulus, and it is there during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. I wanted to double check and investigate Uranus more, and in Greek it is Uranus. It appears 284 times in the New Testament, and is the word mostly translated as heaven. It is Strong's word G3772, if you want to look it up. I couldn't believe it. So during the three days that Jesus spent in the tomb, the planet heaven was sitting in the heart of Leo at the king's star. I ain't gonna lie, that was getting good. It, it became real interesting when he started mapping, you know, the eclipses compared to back then. Like the Great American Eclipse, I'm like, yo, man, that's some real research right there. That's what you call a hunch. What you think of it? Let me know in the comments down below. If this video has reached you right now, then this is by no coincidence. Because out of one billion people on this platform, the universe wants you to receive this message and blessing today. In today's healing session, I am going to align you with the energies of good fortune and divine magic. If you accept this alignment today to shift you into the energies of good fortune and divine magic, then all you need to do is simply nod or say, I accept. Let's begin. I would like to call in Archangel Razael and Archangel Ariel to come on through to you to shift you into the energies of good fortune and divine magic. If you feel like you've been having some bad luck lately, then all of that is about to change after this video. All you need to do is believe it with an open heart and an open mind. Anything is possible in this universe. proceed to pull out and remove any type of negative energies that might interfere with you receiving this good luck, good fortune and divine magic. Please take a deep breath in and out.
I'm now envisioning a white and golden luminescent light coating the entirety of your being and aura with the essence of divine magic and good fortune. May these energies follow you everywhere you go from this time and space moving forward. And so it is. <laughs> and so it is. I like that crystal he was holding. I like the vision of the golden aura. Sound like some super saiyan. But yeah, I wish you well. Let me know in the comments down below if you like this video. It's healing and beyond underscore 12. So go check it out. My find what you're looking for. Guys, have you heard about this? So apparently the United States captured a vampire and tried to keep it a secret. On October 1st, an explorer discovered something the world will never forget. John Holliday was an urban explorer from Dallas. He had heard about an abandoned prison that had closed in 1975 and wanted to explore the site. What he would discover that day, you won't believe. So listen, John walked for nearly an hour through the forest until he arrived at a large rusty fence with barbed wire. Carefully, he made his way through a hole in the fence and headed towards the entrance of the prison. He spent several hours exploring the site until he finally came across a door labeled Solitary. He opened the door without knowing the extraordinary discovery that awaited him. Upon entering, he noticed a trail of blood on the floor leading to a cell at the end of the hallway. He approached the cell and saw a large sign that said, Vampire inside, do not open. The cell door was solid metal and had a um, small slot that could be opened for a feeding tray. Curious, he knocked on the door but received no response. He decided to open the small slot and suddenly a hand rushed out trying to grab him. So the last thing he saw was a set of fangs and eyes looking at him as he ran quickly out of the building. John just uploaded his GoPro video a day ago, but TikTok removed it. And people used to go around with dousing rods and they would find the oscillation. This is a fascinating one. You know when they tell us we're out of water? Well, what's funny is dowsers would go out and find water. And the military actually hires dowsers and big harma and also big oil. So if dowsing was woo-woo, that's what we're told, it's pseudoscience, then why are they all doing it? Finding unlimited water and then also oil, unlimited gas, unlimited gold, unlimited silver, all these materials which are all abundant underneath us. That's what dowsers would do. They would go find it for them and then they would just tap into that. The cactuses that we filmed and the trees that we filmed were all spiraling like a vortex. And that's how you know when you're in a high energy spot. Same with Joshua Tree. You know, a lot of people go to Joshua Tree. There's a lot of vortexes there. Same people go to a lot of Sedona. A lot of vortexes there too. You always see the spiral. That's how you know you're in a high energy place. Everything's twisting because what's happening is, is everything is spinning both directions at the same time. And this spinning in a vortex can actually cause people to go mad. This is what used to happen. So people would go into a vortex area like Sedona and they would have too high and too low and it would actually cause them to go crazy because everything is spinning so much. And somebody just said there's a vortex in the UK. Yes, there's tons by you. The UK has loaded them up. Ireland is loaded with them. Scotland's loaded with them. There's a whole bunch of places where everything's spiraling and just going crazy. Yeah, I find dousing rods very interesting. It's crazy how they used to call them cuckoos. I think it's funny. I guess that's a part of pseudoscience. I don't know. Right? It's crazy. If you go to the deep state machine called Google and type in the five elements, you will never find the ether because they decided to hide the fifth element. Five fingers, five elements. Five points on the body, five elements. The ether represents the middle finger. 
They then demonized the middle finger and considered it swearing. All of this was done to hide the fifth element. Why is it that they want to hide the ether so much? The ether is an ever-present field connecting all things. It fills every millimeter with boundless free energy, acting as a fundamental substance giving rise to all physical matter. Maybe this is why all of the ancient buildings all had antennas on because they were harnessing free energy. The ether serves as a connecting medium between the physical plane and the astral plane, the spirit realm. This is why the word together has ether in it. Together, together, the two worlds join together. Either the ether is both physical and spiritual. It's on either side. Other. Ether is the gateway to the other side of reality, the astral plane. So by hiding the ether, they trapped us all in thinking we are all physical beings and the universe is all physical. When in fact, you have a body for every single one of these dimensions. You have an etheric, astral, mental and physical body. Astral projection is the proof of this. This is why we say think outside the box. The box is the physical world. The triangle represents the ethereal plane. Is I gotta look that up and check it on Google. Let me know in the comments down below if that's true. If this is all true, throw your middle fingers up. I know you do it too. Come on now. Hey yo, where's the suit? Let me know in the comments down below, would you or would you not do it? So shadow work is basically just being your own therapist. What does a therapist do? They ask questions, they listen to you, they stay open, curious. They create a safe space for you to express yourself. While you express yourself, they take their notes and they observe your patterns. When you're doing shadow work, when you're being your own therapist, you're essentially taking notes on the daily about your behavior, your triggers, the things that you're experiencing. And then every few weeks or a few months or so, you go back and you look at everything that you've written. You observe your own patterns. You try and find out what words you're using repeatedly. You try and see what triggers constantly come up for you what people constantly trigger you and then you make an assessment as to where these patterns are coming from and what you need to work on and how you're going to work on it in the meantime as you start to build an awareness around your behavior especially when you're triggered you start to change that behavior. You start to find new ways of relating, more healthy ways of relating. Let's take that personal shadow work model and apply it to the collective. We have ample material on our pattern as a collective recorded in the form of history. Yes, history is written by the victors and yes, the details are muddy, but we can still get a sense of our greatest shadow quality as a species and that's violence violence against nature violence against animals and most importantly human on human violence our tendency towards violence our tendency to practice a bestiality towards one another isn't new we're talking tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions of years worth of aggression in our bodies i mean world war ii was supposed to be the war that ends all wars but i mean but the thing is that even though that promise wasn't kept, it doesn't mean that the desire isn't there. I mean, if you're on this side of TikTok, it means that you want to see a peaceful world. You don't want to see violence in the world anymore. But as regular individual people, what can we do when violence has become so institutionalized and a part of the systems of power? We can start in our heart. We can start by recognizing that violence isn't just guns and artillery and war. Violence is a tone. It's an ugly word, a limiting thought. It can be subtle in the form of passive aggression. It is everything you do or say, every movement you make from a closed heart. For example, when someone does something that bothers you, there are a million ways that you can react or respond to that person, to the situation. You could move from a place of resentment, for example, and say something like, Oh my god, how many times do I have to tell you that that bothers me? You could say nothing about it and be passive aggressive about it later, saying things like, Oh, so you're just gonna do that thing again that I clearly didn't respond to at all? Okay, cool. You could be reactive and abrasive and mean and say something like I need you to stop right now because you look really stupid. 
All of these reactions are coming from a closed heart, a heart closed by fear, resentment, anger. Now, if you open your heart, you're not suppressing your aggression, but rather you're saying, I am a being whose aggression finds expression in love. With an open heart, you feel the pain of what has been said or done without any fear. You take a minute to understand what you're feeling, you let yourself remember that whatever has been done, it's been done by another human being who you do have love for. And you can say something in all honesty and authenticity like, I don't like that, that doesn't make me feel good, and I can't be around you if you're gonna talk to me that way or treat me that way. You don't need to say more than that. People aren't stupid. Now, if that person can't respect your boundary or doesn't want to offer you their understanding, then this is the real crux of the work. This is where you get to decide whether you honor your open heart or you resort to violence. This is where it gets tricky, right? When someone doesn't give you what you want, whether that's on the personal, the individual level, or the collective level. We go to war because one state can't get what it wants from another state. And rather than retreating, rather than reassessing, rather than making a new deal that would benefit the collective more, states will resort to violence. But you don't have to. You can choose peace. You can choose detachment. You can choose love. And sometimes the most loving thing you can do for someone is walk away. One night, everything's quiet and everyone in this house is asleep. And this guy, he gets a hammer and he goes over to his friend's bed where she's sleeping and he swings it down on her as hard as he can. Now the guy's name is Sam. He's 20. He actually goes by the name Psycho Sam because he's an aspiring rapper in the horrorcore genre. Horrorcore is of course a subgenre of rap that sucks. Anyway, one day, Sam, he meets this girl online, and her name's Emma. Now, Emma is only 16, but she's super into horrorcore, and she likes Sam's raps, and he seems pretty cool, and eventually, they start dating. But, unfortunately, they live on opposite sides of the country, so their whole relationship is online. Now, these two online date for about a year, and things are going well. They're really into each other, he's saying, I love you, it's adorable. Then one day, they finally see an opportunity to meet up in person. There's a horrorcore festival happening a few states away from Emma that they can meet up and go to. So boom, it's on, and Sam flies all the way from California to Virginia, where Emma lives, to meet her. And when he gets there, he gets off the plane, and he sees her, and she's beautiful, she's got cool pink hair. I mean, these two are about to have a great time. No, they're not. Because the moment Emma sees Sam, she's very disappointed. But he's really different from his photos. He isn't actually this cool, badass, horrorcore rap guy. In reality, he's really shy and kind of immature. And honestly, she just doesn't find him very good looking. And she's polite and everything, but poor Sam. He knows she's disappointed. He can see it on her face. Regardless, from there, they go and they meet up with Emma's friend, who we'll call Sidekick. And then all three of them get ready to go to the show. Then Emma's mom and Emma's dad, who we'll just call Emma's mom and Emma's dad, they drive the three of them out to this horrorcore music festival. So they get to the festival, and the music's good, and a lot of their online friends are there. And Sam wants to spend time with Emma, but still, Emma's not really feeling him. And this is upsetting for Sam. And it's not long before they get into a fight. And I guess this fight is really bad, because Emma ends up breaking it off with Sam. And this just destroys him. He's devastated. So eventually the concert ends and Emma's mom and dad drive them to Emma's mom's house. Then Emma's dad leaves because they don't actually live together. Emma's mom and dad are divorced. So now you got Sam, Emma, sidekick, and Emma's mom all in this house. And Sam plans to stay a few more days and then he's going to fly back home. But, quietly, Sam has been stewing this whole time. So they all go to bed, and they're in separate rooms. And Sam, he's just lying there, and he's pissed off. I mean, he loves this girl, and now she wants nothing to do with him? And later, around 3 a.m., he's still up, and everyone else is asleep. And he gets up, and he searches the house, and he finds a ball-peen hammer. And then he creeps over to the couch where Sidekick is sleeping. He's so angry about the whole situation, he swings the hammer down on her, and it unalives her instantly, before she can even wake up. Then he goes upstairs where Emma's mom is sleeping, and he does the same thing to her. 
And finally, he creeps over into Emma's room, and she's there sleeping peacefully, and he does the same thing to her. Then, a few days go by, and Sam is still there in the house with the bodies. Now, Sidekick's mom, who we'll just call Sidekick's mom, she hasn't been able to get a hold of Sidekick for a few days, and she's getting worried. So she calls police to go over there to do a welfare check on her. Then police show up to Emma's house, and they knock, and Sam answers the door. But officers, I guess, don't see or smell anything wrong. So they just ask him a few questions, and then they leave. But Sidekick's mom is not not satisfied with this. She knows something's wrong. So she calls Emma's dad and she asks him to go over there and check. And Emma's dad's like, sure, I'll go over there and check on him. So Emma's dad drives all the way over to his ex-wife's house and then he walks in the front door and he doesn't see anything wrong. It's super quiet. Then suddenly, Sam sneaks up behind him with the hammer and pow, right in the back of the head. And of course, Emma's dad doesn't survive that attack. Then Sam grabs Emma's dad's car keys and he steals his car and he drives it to the airport. Now, I'm not exactly sure how this happened, but on his way to the airport, somehow Sam veers off the road and gets the car stuck in a ditch. So then a police officer and a tow truck driver show up to tow him. And the officer writes him a ticket for crashing his car in the ditch, but whatever. The tow truck driver ends up giving him a ride to the airport. Meanwhile, Sidekick's mom is still at home and she's still freaking out because now she hasn't heard from Emma's dad in a while. So she calls the police again and police are like, fine, we'll go over there again and police go back to Emma's house to do a second welfare check and they get there and this time it immediately smells like bodies so immediately police call this in like okay we're looking for this psycho Sam guy and the officer who wrote Sam the ticket for crashing the car in the ditch is like hey I think I just wrote that guy a ticket for crashing his car in the ditch so police rush to the airport and they find Sam there sleeping in the terminal waiting for his flight so they arrest him here's his mugshot and then Sam goes to trial he pleads guilty and he gets life yo shout outs to real Ray William, that was an interesting story, but boy, horrorcore, gotta stay away from it. We read the code of the Matrix. If you're watching this video, that means you are in a position to receive this. What that means is that every color you see, every scent you smell, every person you meet, every name you hear, every sound you take in, is all code that has been written for you and by you. The way we break this code down is architected between the ones and the zeros, between the masculine and the feminine, between giving and receiving. And within that intention and integrity of humanity is where the magic lives. It is our responsibility to align with how the code was written because we wrote the code in the reflection of ourselves. So every person that we meet, every video that we watch, Everything that we taste, smell, touch, see is all for us to remember how to break the code of this matrix. Continue to walk with me on this journey and we will open the doors on why we see what we see, why we taste what we taste, why we watch what we watch and align all of that back to becoming your most loving you. You could sever the connection at gate 12 and have gate 11 and down be your own little universe if you wanted to hijack it. That was their idea. It worked. <laughs> and there was a choice that the Elohai made. There was a choice to defend or to allow. Now the Elohai knew that they were eternal. Death isn't something that frightened them. They were completely beyond that. They knew that if they were to defend themselves because they had superior power capacity that those who attempted to destroy them would literally have the energy bounce back at themselves and literally wipe them out and the systems they were connected to it would not only take out the Elohim that were posing the challenge it would take out the Seraphi Seraphim both the fallen ones and a group called the Odetokron the Odetokron were a race of Seraphi Seraphim who had co-governance over Stargate 10, Vega, with the Omicron Draconians. The Odetokrons were the Reptilians. There is a difference between the Draconians and the Reptilians. The Draconians were the Dragon Moth people. They were the Dinoids. They created dinosaur-like, as opposed to snake-like, as opposed to smaller reptilian. The Omicron dragon moth dinoids were fully involved in the competition for the time matrix they knew what the Elohim, or Elohim were going to do and they decided they would do it too they didn't petition for help 
they said, fine, we'll both get rid of them and then we'll go after each other and see who gets the matrix. But the Adetokron, the reptilians, didn't want to play the game. They were stuck in the Gate 10 system and they petitioned for help. But because you had Gate 11 and the Elohim in the middle, in between Gate 12 and Gate 10, we weren't able to rescue or get the Odetokron out. So if the decision to defend by simply putting up a shield around Gate 12 was chosen, it would have taken out both Gate 11 and Gate 10, which could have been repaired. It would have taken a long time, but it could have been repaired using Gate 12. But those consciousness that were, were in those systems would be fragmented back to space dust. They'd still be part of God, as I've said. You can never be not part of God. But races that had beautiful potential, and they'd already come a long way in their evolution, they'd evolved from 950 billion years ago to 250 billion years ago. That's a lot of evolution. And they had reached wondrous things in their own right in certain ways. It was primarily because of the Odetokron, of the reptilians, that the founders chose to allow, knowing they were taking a burden onto themselves. But it was the only way that if they allowed it, they would slowly be able to heal it. They knew a black hole would be created if this were allowed. They tried to talk them out of it, but they didn't want to listen. The Elohim did not want to listen. Instead of defending themselves, they allowed the Elohim to back up gate 11 and reverse it and that created a backflow and it literally shattered the divine blueprint and blew up the stargates in Lyra Aramitana. That would have to be reassembled later using the D13 and higher primal light fields to reset the pattern. It created a black hole system. That black hole system came to be known as phantom matrix. Phantom matrix was originally a part of this time matrix. Phantom matrix started with simply part of the D11 Avion gate and what was that planetary system or star system and the D10 Vega Lyra system. But it grew much bigger than was ever intended. When the Phantom Matrix was created by the Anu Elohim, they came to call themselves the Anu Elohim, the Giovanni entity hadn't fully fallen. A portion of that entity had fallen. And because of that, it sent another portion of itself into the matrix to try to rescue the part of itself that had fallen. That was a risky thing to do because, again, it comes down to how much energy is on which side. Normally, an entity would put X amount of itself into the matrix at one time. Well, it already lost a big chunk of itself, so it put more of itself in and there was a chance that was taken. If that part ended up getting distorted also and couldn't, wasn't strong enough to pull the others back out, it would make more critical mass of reversed mess in the matrix than what the uh, collective had itself, the, uh, the uh, Ascendant Master Collective had itself. And that is what happened, but it happened in stages. When the original fall happened, the original sin, when Stargate 11 blew up, yeah, 20, 250 billion years ago, and Phantom Matrix was created, there were precautionary things put in, in motion, knowing that it was going to occur. There was something called the Eye of Brahman that was created at D12.5. Now, that was a little bit beyond the D12 um, stargate. It, the Eye of Brahman was a polarization refraction lens that would allow the primal light fields from the natural to this time matrix to refract through and literally anchor into the phantom matrix to hold it, to give it a structure so it could begin to restructure itself instead of going completely back to space dust. Because what happens when a black hole is created? A template is shattered like um, a crystal that's crushed with a hammer. It gets twisted, the energy gets twisted and reversed, but if it has any portion of its template that has enough frequency, it can begin to accrete again. What usually happens in a black hole system is it accretes like to like frequency, but it's missing pieces and it isn't able to accrete functionally. So it, it, it accretes on a, a distorted 
template compared to its original mathematics. The Eye of Brahman was intended to allow the pattern of the natural template of this time matrix to be put back in to Phantom Matrix. So when it began to reaccrete itself and the consciousness began to pull itself together, it would still have, eventually, after it accreted enough, it would have access to getting plugged back in to its original divine blueprint. That was the original intention. So there was a lens, the first eye, the eye of Brahman, created. And it was created by the, the Christos founders and Dhyanas, Ascended Masters races, in order to give the beings that would be caught in the black hole system an opportunity to re-evolve instead of being you know, blown back to space dust. And again, it was done primarily because you had several innocent races, but primarily the Odetokron, who had been persecuted by the draconian races progressively more and more. There was no way they could get out of the system, and they had always been in good standing with, with the Christos founders' races. So there was a commitment made on behalf of them, but also on behalf of the others, because even though the Anu Elohim had gone off on their own tangent and become very dangerous creator gods, they had become anti-creator gods, anti-Christic creator gods, they were still loved, and there was still the, if there's life, there's hope, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> you know? So it was a decision of love. But it was a decision of accepting, out of love, accepting a huge, massive responsibility. The responsibility of knowing how dangerous this healing... And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed tonight's rabbit hole. If you haven't already, please take a second just to smash that like. Subscribe. Ring that notification bell just to make sure the algorithm knows what's up. So what are we going to do, y'all? That's right, run these numbers up. Thanks again, until next time.